The fitness landscape metaphor is a useful way to visualize the evolutionary process. Fitness landscapes were first described by Sewell Wright in 1932 in a paper using population genetics concepts to study various evolutionary forces. The way a fitness landscape works is that we create a figure with a vertical axis for fitness and others for the range of genotypes or phenotypes of individuals. Individuals who vary in their genotypes or phenotypes will have different locations on the non-fitness axes, and that location will map up to a point on a fitness surface. Individuals with higher fitness will reproduce more than ones with lower fitness, so the next generation will have individuals more like the ones higher on the landscape. Selection will push the population uphill. The diagrams here show simple two-dimensional landscapes, one using a range of values for a phenotype as the horizontal axis, and another using a continuum of genotypes. The vertical axis is fitness, represented here by the usual symbol for fitness, W, in honor of Sewell Wright. If you look at these figures, you can see how, when the individuals with higher fitness reproduce, this will draw the population up the slopes of the fitness landscape. Instead of just considering a single phenotypic or genotypic trait, fitness landscapes are usually used for more than one trait. If we consider two traits, then we get a three-dimensional fitness surface laying above the two axes. It's hard to draw three-dimensional surfaces, so the most common way to think about them is to visualize this scenario by looking down at the trait axes from above and marking isoclines, which are points on the surface of equal fitness. If you've ever looked at an elevation map for hiking or a weather forecast, you've seen lines like these showing equal altitudes or temperatures over a two-dimensional geographic region. The pair of figures show a fitness landscape with the lowest fitness value at the minimum value for traits 1 and 2. The fitness increases as each of the two traits increases. This continues up to a maximum fitness for the maximum values of traits 1 and 2. The curved surface in the lower figure would be represented by the isoclines shown in the upper figure. Now the population, represented by the group of points, would move uphill over this surface, increasing both their trait 1 and trait 2 values over time as selection favors the individuals higher on the surface. Looking at our isocline figure, the population would move up and to the right. Keep in mind that it's not the individuals moving up the slopes themselves exactly like the animation, it's reproduction over generations, creating new individuals at each new location, that's really happening. This metaphor is why evolution is sometimes called a hill climbing process. In more abstract theoretical fields that study these evolutionary processes, like applied mathematics and computer science, this term can be quite common. Earlier, I said that the axes can be phenotypes or genotypes. For the rest of this video, I'll be looking at landscapes with phenotypic axes because they're more straightforward. Genotypes are often not continuous like these axes, and the metaphor gets a bit more complicated, so we'll come back to that. Here's another example of a fitness landscape. The one shown on the left is the smooth slope we just thought about. On the right is a landscape with low fitness in the lower left, minimum values of both traits. But the maximum fitness is at a location with large, but not maximum, values of the traits. This location of maximum fitness surrounded by lower fitness values on all sides is referred to as a fitness peak. In this case, the populations would also climb the fitness slope, but the final set of traits will differ. Once a population is at the maximum height on the fitness landscape, it will tend to stay there. A population moving off a peak is highly unlikely because it would require the individuals lower down on the surface to reproduce more than the ones at the peak. Another commonly used term when thinking about fitness landscapes is the idea of a fitness valley. This is a region of lower fitness between two regions of higher fitness. The pair of figures here show what I mean. There are two fitness peaks, and the region between them has lower fitness, it's a fitness valley. Also, note how the higher peak, peak 2, can be identified in the isocline figure by the larger number of isoclines between the valley and the peak. Since fitness valleys represent lower fitness values than surrounding areas, we often talk about how populations are very unlikely to cross fitness valleys. If a population was on one peak, it wouldn't move to the other. We've covered the basics of fitness landscapes. Now let's take a look at what we can learn about evolution from them. Insight number one is that the pattern of variation can influence the evolutionary trajectory. Fisher's fundamental theorem states that the rate of evolution is proportional to the amount of genetic variation for a trait, so the population will tend to most easily move in the direction of highest variation, assuming equal steepness of the slope. We can also think about how the movement of the population shown on the landscape will correspond to changes in the values of the traits over time. Looking at the plots of the separate traits now, as the population evolves, both traits will increase together roughly equally. We often can't see fitness landscapes directly, but if we see a population's average traits change like this, we can infer what the landscape looks like. On the other hand, if the initial pattern of variation looks like this, then Fisher's fundamental theorem tells us that the population will initially respond in the horizontal direction more than the vertical because that direction exhibits more variation. After the population has increased trait 2 for a while, then the variation will be reduced and now selection will be as effective at changing trait 1. 
On the landscape, the population will take a curved route to the final state. Looking at the plots of the separate traits now, we can see them respond differently. Trait 1 is slow to change initially, but increases later. Trait 2 increases fastest initially, but then more slowly at the end. Our second insight comes from the first. The pattern of variation can influence the final phenotype. In this figure, the population starts in a fitness valley. The landscape has two peaks, so selection is acting to draw the population to both the top right and the bottom left. However, since there's more variation in the horizontal direction, the population will respond to selection on trait 2 better, and the population will be drawn to peak number 1. Looking at the plots of the separate traits now, we can see how trait 2 changes quickly from the beginning, with trait 1 changing just a little at the end. Our third insight comes from the second. Response to selection does not guarantee the best outcome. In this fitness landscape, there are two peaks, with the one on the lower left representing the highest overall fitness. However, the population only experiences selection on the part of the surface where it is, and the same combination of variation and local selection as in the previous example will drive the population to the inferior fitness peak. At each step, the population is improving and the best individuals are thriving, but the final phenotype achieved is not the best one possible. Evolution has resulted in the population moving to a non-optimal state. For this reason, we say that evolution is short-sighted, not goal-directed. Technically, evolution is something called a Markov process, a system where the next step depends only on the current state, not the past or some final optimum. The fourth insight arrives from recognizing that sometimes stochasticity, randomness, can be important. In this example, we see an initial population in a fitness valley and there is no pattern of variation that favors one direction or the other. Once there are more individuals on one side than on the other though, the population will keep going up the slope on that side since populations don't move downwards or cross valleys. It's a 50-50 chance which side will win. The population could go either way. Will this population evolve to have small versions of both traits or larger versions? It's up to chance. The entire process is not completely chance, of course. Non-random selection will take the population to the final peak, but the little bit of chance at the beginning can have a big effect on how this population evolves. You can even imagine that if there were multiple populations in this same situation, some might evolve one way and others might evolve the other. Our previous example leads us to this fifth insight. Speciation is predicted on certain landscapes. Imagine we had a single big population in some fitness valley. If something causes the population to split, even temporarily, or there is positive assortative mating, then there might be something almost like two different populations, even if only for a few breeding seasons. If that happens, and the two subpopulations evolve in different directions, then they will end up looking quite different from one another. A single population with individuals that all looked similar has become two different populations that look different. That's the start of speciation. Now let's think about these two populations. Hybrids between individuals on the two different peaks would have lower fitness because their traits are likely to be intermediate and place them right in the fitness valley. This creates selection favoring individuals who don't make hybrids. Individuals who mate exclusively with similar individuals produce offspring on the peak, which produces more grandchildren, etc. Individuals who mate with individuals from the other peak will produce offspring in the valley, which produces fewer grandchildren, etc. If there is genetic variation for mating preference, and there is genetic variation for most things, then this selection will result in the evolution of mating preferences that can lead to reproductive isolation. A single population that gets divided into two populations which stop mating with each other is the first step towards permanent speciation. This video just covers the basics of the fitness landscape metaphor, but let's quickly look at some of the details that more complicated models would involve. There are generally three different types of landscapes. All use fitness as the vertical axis, but vary in using the phenotypic values like we've been discussing, genotypic values, or even allele frequencies. The last two are much harder to visualize, but the math can be done. Landscapes are often classified into three categories, flat, smooth, and rugged. Flat would be for situations in which the alleles are neutral or all the different phenotypes have equal fitness. Populations would move over these surfaces purely by genetic or phenotypic drift. Smooth landscapes are like the ones we've been looking at, smooth and continuous. Rugged landscapes are ones in which there can be dramatic fitness differences over very short distances on the axes with sharp valleys. Examining mathematical models which compare evolutionary behavior on smooth and rugged landscapes is an active area of research. Landscapes can also be created for more than two traits, and these give you something called an n-dimensional hyperspace with hypersurfaces. This is hard or impossible to visualize, but the math is possible and insights can be obtained using math instead of diagrams. Landscapes can also change, they're not static. The fitness landscape for an organism will change as the environment changes, as epistatic effects from other alleles alter genotype axes, and from other species moving on their own fitness landscapes and altering their traits. Lastly, there is a famous quote by Arturo Rosenbluth and Norbert Wiener which states that the price of metaphor is eternal vigilance. 
What this means is that while metaphors can be very powerful tools for understanding, we must constantly guard against taking them too far or using them in inappropriate ways. I hope you found this video useful, and as always, a high-resolution PDF of this screen is available on the Evolution Examples website. Help this video climb YouTube's algorithmic hill to get more visibility by clicking subscribing and sharing.